Hey, what's going on guys? Mackenzie Long here. So I had a question come up to myself and I was wondering, would they actually ever cancel student loans? It's a big topic that we hear of all the time now. And as we kind of come back into this season of elections, I think we'll probably start to hear it a lot more. And so I really wanted to understand it a little bit better and figure out who would be impacted by it? How would they kind of figure some of these things out? Who ends up with the bill? All of these things kind of started coming to mind if they would actually cancel student loans. And the reason why I think it's really important is it's a great platform to be able to run on. There's lots of people who will have student loans because of kids going to school. So I think that's a huge thing to be able to say. And what does it actually mean for people if they would cancel student loans? So all of this stuff was kind of coming to mind. And the nice part is I've had seven times redoing this particular video because my old Rode mic busted. So I had the Bit Mic Pro and it broke. And so I was getting partial audio and which was a ton of fun. So I ended up getting the Diggity D3 Pro, which I'm pretty excited. So that's exactly what you're hearing as far as audio goes now. So I'm interested to see how that works as there were some great reviews about it. But anyway, back into student loans. And if you can go ahead and smash the like button while we're here anyway, that would be great. And as we get back into this idea of student loans, there's a couple different questions that come to mind. And the first one was, well, what does it mean? How much money are people actually spending on school so that we can kind of have a general idea of what is it going to cost if we get rid of student loans? And so I was doing some searching on, on thinkimpact.com. It actually gave us a great analysis of about how much it costs to go to school. And they said on average, and this is obviously going up, but on average in today's dollars, it's about $25,000 per year for a student to be able to go to school. So averaging over a four year degree would be about $100,000. Now, obviously this doesn't include engineers and doctors and lawyers. Those obviously are going to go to school. But they said on average for somebody who's going to get a four year degree, it's about $25,000 per year. But then I started wondering, well, do most kids finish in four years? Do they finish early? Do they take longer? So in searching into that, I found insightintouniversity.com. And insightintouniversity.com said that the average student for a four-year degree will actually spend six years going to school. So now we're not talking about $100,000 at $25,000 per year, now times six, is actually closer to $150,000 because, and so now we've got to start to ask some additional questions in that somebody is now starting six years behind most other people in the workforce. They're $150,000 behind because of student loans. And now obviously I'm not attacking education here. We're just trying to look at what some of these numbers are. My mom has been a school teacher for 30 something years. I went to mechanical engineering school. I think that education education is great, but with inflation and the cost of things going up, especially school, I think even now more than ever, we need to look at, is it actually worth it? As tuition costs increase and quality decreases, or at least all this craziness that we're hearing on the news about schools and all of this stuff that's going on. And then also looking at what is the result after being six years behind the rest of the working force, being $150,000 in debt, does it really make much of a difference to get your degree? And in light of all of that, one of the biggest campaigns that has been run on is well, if you vote for me, I will cancel your student loans. And I think that's an incredible statement to be able to make that I'm basically going to give everybody who has student loans $150,000. Now, obviously we know that those amounts are going to vary. Some people have more, some people have less. There's been no real description of what they actually mean by forgiving student loans. So I'm just assuming that their blanket statement, about $150,000 per person. And I think that could potentially be a huge swing for voters because how many people have student loans that feel that they would be able to do better financially if they didn't have to pay that couple hundred dollars a month or a couple thousand dollars a month into their student loans. To me, this would also potentially impact parents who have kids who are about to go to school. It would be kind of cool if somebody else was going to pay for that college and I didn't have to. 
And what about our friends that have student loans? We'd want to help them out too, right? So I think there's a huge base of people that this touches as far as potential votes into a particular campaign. And really the premise is, if we were to forgive everybody all of these loans, they could actually do better financially because now they would have more money to save or more money to spend on things and it would help drive the economy. They could get back on track. There'd be less stress, less debt. So it sounds like it could be pretty incredible. Now, I don't know if it's the engineer in me, yes, I'm still a recovering engineer, that I'm naturally skeptical. So when people say things, I don't naturally believe it right away. I like to look at their actions and see what they actually do and if it's something that could actually be done. So it really made me question is, well, who would be impacted by this as far as the downside to it, right? Because if we're talking about $150,000 per person, well, who's going to pay that or who's going to lose out on that money that they should have gotten because obviously these people already received something. Yes, it's a service, it's not necessarily a good, but they already received their education, they already received that piece of paper. So now who's going to be penalized by it? And originally I thought, well, and in the beginning I thought, well, this would probably be a great way to kind of shove it in the school's face and say, hey, you're charging too much, this is all your fault, you're the one who's driving up all these costs. It's gotten easier and easier to have classrooms and classes online. I was talking to a friend and she was saying it was about 20 to $30,000 even to take classes online, which is crazy to me. So how is it it's gotten easier to produce, but yet it continues to get more and more expensive? And my skepticism wrapped around that is, why would they want to entice people to do something that's becoming less and less? It would be a great way to stick it to the schools and say, hey, you need to charge less. And because you've overcharged everybody, well, now we're gonna come in and kind of kick your butt a little bit because you've been doing this terrible thing to our economy. And so now we're gonna punish the schools and the education system, namely higher education, the colleges specifically, and say, well, we're not gonna pay you this money back for all of these kids who have already received their goods. And that seemed like potentially, okay, we're gonna punish the people who have been causing a lot of these problems. And all of that sounds great. It's the government, they're gonna come in and protect the people, and they're gonna punish the bad guys, and all of this is going to make us more prosperous. But what was really interesting is I started to dig into who carries this debt balance, it was really interesting to me as I stumbled upon Yahoo's website, and they were talking about the largest assets that the government actually possesses. Into the tune of 50% of the government's assets are student loan. So wait a second, you're telling me that there's somebody who works for the government who's portraying a message that they're going to punish schools and help all of these people, but yet they are the ones with the biggest balance sheet. So they're the ones that this is an asset for them, that they're making money from people going to school, yet they are somehow going to forgive all of these loans. Now, the good part of this is that they do have the power to actually do that, but I wanna ask you a question. Would you be willing to give up 50% of your assets? Now, whether that's a stock portfolio, or maybe your real estate portfolio, or maybe it's just your job, and you're gonna go into your boss and say, hey, I'd like to make 50% less income this year and still provide the same exact quality and work ethic that I had of the previous years. My guess is you would probably not do that. So then my question is, would the government want to do the same thing? That if their largest asset, meaning thing that makes them money, on their bank sheet is student loans, would they actually want to get rid of them? Now, I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist. I don't get into a lot of those things, but I find it mildly interesting that it, the current administration or any administration would pose something, and I know in politics this would never happen, but that they would present an idea that they were willing to do something for the people to help the people, and then actually have no real thoughts or plan of actually doing it or no real authority to be able to do it because they would also have to get approval for it. They can't just wave a magic wand or say something out loud and all of this debt gets erased. But I'm saying it's probably or possibly possible that uh, maybe some people were saying some things and they didn't actually mean that they were going to do anything about it. So why do we as people fall for these types of lies? And I think this all falls back 
on the lack of financial literacy. Because if you're willing to take a couple minutes like I did and go through the numbers and figure out who's holding these assets and who's actually profiting from these things, it's pretty clear to say whether somebody's doing something to just say it and get votes or whether somebody's saying it because they actually want to fix a problem. But the challenge is if we don't understand how money works and even what an asset or a liability is, how do we know what that means? And one of the biggest challenges with financial literacy is simply the vocabulary. Because people don't understand what's being said because they don't understand financial literacy, they're oftentimes being taken advantage of and they make lots of mistakes when it comes to money. And the reason why this is important is because in what they thought they were going to get in getting their student loans canceled, now they have super high inflation rates and they have all time high gas prices everything is more expensive from food to milk to everything we need to sustain ourselves rent is going crazy now I'm not putting this all on one administration that would not be fair but it's important to understand these things and the consequences of them and that a particular administration or a particular person would violate that and say hey vote for me with no real plan of ever doing anything and then turn around later and just say oh well thank you for your vote but I'm not gonna do anything with student loans I think is pretty malicious. Now, if you are struggling with student loans or loans of any type, whether it's credit card, as long as it's not attached to something like a house or a car, there are a lot of programs that you can use to actually get out of debt. And what that means is many times it will put into a program where it'll reduce that debt to 50 or 60% of what it once was. It'll put a 0% interest rate on it. And then you can actually start working on getting out of debt in the next couple years. And within two, three, maybe four years, you can be completely out of debt. You cut your payments, usually about in half and you get paid off in the next couple of years versus what most people will do is they continue to pay that balance over and over and over again. But the challenge is all they're paying is the interest on it. They're not even actually touching the balance. And to this day, I can't count how many people are doing that same exact thing where they're just paying the basic payment on it. They might make some extra money and then they try to pay it down, but then something happens, they get right back into debt. So if you're kind of in that cycle, it is important to focus on debt and getting some of those things paid off. And whether this administration does anything about student loans or not, there are programs actually out there to help you with your student loans. A lot of them are based on income, but they will help you reduce that payment and then eventually get that completely off of the books. There are programs out there that will help you if you reach out and find these people who are willing to help with these things. But here's the overarching challenge is the less you understand about money and the more tight you are with money, the easier you are to be manipulated. If you didn't have student loans, you wouldn't be worried about who you voted for based on what they could give you or what they're saying they're going to give you as far as money goes. And so because you're not financially stable, you're easily manipulated. The reason why a lot of people stay at the job that they hate and do the things that they know they shouldn't be doing at that job is because they're tight with money. And so if you're tired of being in that situation, I highly recommend that you get educated on money. And whether you go and you buy a Dave Ramsey book or you do a program online, uh, I love that there's a great book called How Money Works by Steve Siebold and Tom Matthews. I think that's a fantastic book as well. I even took that and turned it into a course that if you want to take it, it's actually down below. You do have to make an account with Teachable, but there's no money required. Use that coupon code 995 off. It's 100% off. You can get it totally free. And at least in there, you can learn the vocabulary. You can start to understand what an asset and what a liability is. What is savings? What is investing? These simple concepts that if we don't even understand the difference between them, how can we ever start to understand our personal finances and start to become financially free when it comes to money if we don't even understand the language of money. And then I recommend you reach out and find a mentor, have somebody who's going to help you through these things. And if that's something that I can come alongside you and help with, great. If you just don't like me, or maybe you just don't like redheads, that's fine too, but find somebody who can help you with these things to get you into a better financial situation. And then that way you won't be pulled side to side, depending on who's giving you the biggest promise of something we're not going to deliver on anyway. And I hope this was helpful for you. Don't forget to smash the like button and also leave a comment if you feel that they will actually take care of student loans or if you believe that they will never take care of student loans. I'd love to hear that as well. Maybe you have a different theory than I do. And also don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the little bell next to it as well. That way you can see additional content as it comes out and we can work on your financial literacy together. Catch you later. Bye.